Kath, uh, Dr. Kath Pern is a lecturer in mathematics education at the University of Melbourne. She's taught in the Master of Teaching programs across all levels, early childhood, primary and secondary, and is currently supporting South Australian teachers in both early childhood and the R2 numeracy programs. Kath is particularly interested in the identification and assistance for students mathematically at risk of not meeting the national minimum standards and those who are not achieving their mathematical potential. Kath is also a Senior Research Fellow in the Assessment and Reporting Division at ACER, ACER, and Kath developed Mathematics Intervention, a program for Year 1 students mathematically at risk, which she continues to support. Her PhD investigated the links between fractional competence and algebraic reasoning in the middle year students. So welcome, Kath. And you can see from Kath's title that she'll be focusing on some of that work around helping students who really are not at the level that we'd like them to be um, in their learning progression. And uh, I know Kath has done quite a bit of work for MAV over the years as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was mentioned this morning that Kath is one of those people who will put teachers at ease, make them feel comfortable, but also give them the confidence to really make a difference. So I really look forward to having Kath here this morning to talk to you all. So over to you, Kath. Thanks, Peter, and I'll share my screen. Okay, so as Peter said, um, this is one of my passions. Uh, it is um, about identifying and assisting students um, that are considered to be, well, I would say mathematically at risk. And I guess in my um, many years as a maths educator, as a primary teacher, uh, I have been really privileged to work with students from age five or even before school, uh, right through to tertiary students. And I guess having that, um, that, that luxury of working with students, you actually discover that um, in some cases, nothing changes unless we actually provide some additional support or some assistance. Um, and certainly, as Ailey said, that whole notion of mass anxiety um, does prevent um, further, um, further progress. Uh, and it was lovely to listen to Alan yesterday because um, a lot of what I'm going to show you today or talk about today actually, I think, fits into his five categories, his five, but we just didn't have the vocabulary for that at the time. So um, hopefully, um, you will make some of those links with what Alan also said yesterday. So your first challenge, now people who've heard me speak may already have met this challenge, may already have had those thoughts. But what I'd like you to do is think about what does the word five mean and what does the word triangle mean? So just, in, just uh, we're, we weren't going to break out rooms, I just want you personally to think about if I said to you, can you tell me what the word five means? What would you say? And if I said, what does the word triangle mean? So this is work from uh, David Tall and Eddie Gray from the UK, from Warwick University. And this was two questions that they actually asked students at the tertiary level, um, people wandering around the campus at Warwick University. And the reason they asked this question was to sort of highlight the, the difference between it is much easier to describe what a triangle is. I think if we all were sitting uh, around in the lecture theatre and I would have asked you to respond, most of you would have been very comfortable with responding to the defining a triangle. Three sides, three corners, um, you would, that, that's something you can picture, you would almost do it. The word five is actually a little bit harder. Um, what do you want me to say? It's five fingers, um, five is one more than four, uh, five is a half of 10. So there's actually a lot of information in the notion of five. And so David and Eddie came up with a term which they called a procept. And they said that the symbol five represents all this information and that students who are doing really well at maths are what they called proceptual thinkers. In other words, they not only knew the rules and procedures, but they also understood the concepts. So they could give you a lot of information about five. And in Alastair McIntosh's words, they had really good number sense. So um, I'm currently tutoring my year 11 grandson. And one of the things I've noticed is that he seems to have forgotten all his number sense. 
he was certainly in primary school very able to tell me all the different factors of things but now that he's reached year 11 he is struggling to would determine what two numbers uh, multiplied together to give me 12 and if I added those same two numbers which will give me 13 because he hasn't practiced them and certainly the maths anxiety has hit with great force. So I'm going to, uh, at the time I um, was thinking about the keynote, I was actually, one of my tasks at ACR was to look at the TIMS uh, year four and year eight items. Um, I had access to those items before, this is before the report was released. This was when students had actually performed, um, done the testing at year four. So the TIMS is the big international, one of the big international studies that Australia is part of. And my role uh, was to determine whether or not the questions actually were appropriate for Australian year four students. In other words, match them up with what uh, was being asked. So could I look at the question and say, yes, it matched that content descriptor from um, uh, our Australian curriculum or not? Um, interesting results were that actually very few of the questions that were being asked at year four were appropriate for Australian year four students if we judged them against what was expected uh, as according to the curriculum. So that was a bit scary. Year eight was the, was the reverse. Most of the questions were appropriate for year eight students in Australia. Um, and so I guess even when we start looking at results, we need to think about, well, were the questions appropriate? Do they fit with what we, uh, the students have been learning? So, um, over the last little while, they, those results have been published. And interestingly for you, uh, for you of you, those of you in the audience who are in the early childhood sector, the, one of the statements that has come out has said that the lower student literacy and numeracy skills when beginning primary school may be contributing to Australia's poorer achievement in year four math. So again, you might want to go and read that article. Why are they saying this? So if we look at Tim's, it's, it's, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's the same sort of thing as when we have NAPLAN. They do test across the strands, number, measurement and geometry, um, and the proportions are there. Interestingly, um, our students did much better on data and did much better on geometry. They certainly didn't do quite so well, on, or they didn't quite do quite so well on number. And they learned just like NAPLAN, they are trying to think of the cognitive domains as well. So the people developing those items would have developed items that tested their cognitive domains as well as the content areas. So if we look at the current, um, the graphs, remember the last one was 2019. It does take a long while to write these reports. So Australia, you can see when you, we had headlines that said, you know, we're not doing any better. There hasn't been, um, there was an improvement at 2007, but 2019, our results are very similar. And if we look at Victoria, um, although the numbers aren't significant, there's a slight decline, but of course the press will make big deals of that. So um, Jeff Masters, who is my boss at the ACR, talks about the trajectories of low achievement beginning well before school. And he commented that differences by year three tend to be continuations of differences apparent on that entry to school, when they have lots of uh, widely varying levels of cognitive, language, physical, social and emotional development. And of course, they all impact on whether or not they're going to be successful with maths. And again, there's an article there that you might like to read in the teacher magazine um, on the ACR website. So going back to this notion of foundation and literacy skills, the, it has come from the questionnaire data from teachers, students and principals. So they're saying that the poor achievement may be due to students not having, not being able to recognise and write letters of the alphabet, not being able to read and write some words, not recognising numbers higher than 10 and doing simple addition and subtraction. So it makes a big difference if prior to school, students already have these skills. Now, there was a test um, designed by um, Brian Doig, which unfortunately, I, in the sh because we were locked down, I wasn't able to access, which was called Who Am I? 
And Brian and Molly's um, test, Who Am I?, actually tests these skills and has been used across uh, the world. It's been translated into other languages. So you might want to consider, uh, certainly in the early childhood space, uh, not just the numeracy, but the literacy. Um, and so uh, another interesting fact is the fact that only half of Australia's year fours attended schools where more than a quarter of the students entered those schools with those foundational literacy and numeracy skills. Whereas compared internationally, where there is 80% of their year fours would have had students entering their, their um, with uh, foundational skills. So um, other interesting facts from Tim. So 70% of the Australian year four students achieve what they deem to be national proficient, proficient standards compared to 96% of other higher achieving countries. So we've got 30% of students who aren't achieving that. Uh, they related, they could make a relationship between uh, the number of books in the home. So while we're not talking maths, we are linking back to the connections with mathematical literacy, the links with literacy, we can't, we can't separate them out. So if you have, if the students had more books in their, in their homes, they were more likely to do better on those year four exam, the, that year four test. Uh, Australian students, as I said, performed much, relatively better in data, but were much weaker in number. And the measurement and geometry scores were about what you would expect for the overall score but number is letting them down. And this has been confirmed by work that I have done in South Australia, looking, analysing the PAT data that we're getting from um, South Australian students at Year 6. So while their overall score is looking okay, it's because they're doing better on data and measurement and geometry, not on number. So um, interestingly, I guess that Australian Year 4 students performed relatively better on reasoning, but weren't so good on knowing. So those tasks that were deemed to be knowing tasks rather than reasoning tasks, they didn't do quite so better, so well. So what do they deem to be a low international benchmark? Well, students at the low international benchmark, this is the TIMS. Um, things say that the students have some basic mathematical knowledge. They can add, subtract, multiply and divide one and two digit whole numbers. Remember, this is students at year four. They can solve simple word problems. They have some knowledge of simple fractions and common geometric shapes. They can read and complete simple bar graphs. And uh, the percentage they gave were 10% of year four students. Now, again, we need to little bit, be a little bit cautious about these results um, because we know that, as I said, when I looked at the match between curriculum and the tasks, there wasn't a very good match at Year 4. So if we look at our national testing, we, we know that students at Year 3, uh, considered to be at Band 2, are at the national minimum standards, and if they're at Band 4 of Year 5. So if we look at Year 3, we're saying that these students who are at the minimum standards can use counting strategies to solve problems and demonstrate knowledge of place value of three digit numbers. They identify the next term in a simple pattern. So that's not giving us very much information. By year, at year five, um, they, uh, sorry, that, that's the students who aren't meeting the benchmark. The ones that meeting the benchmark compare and order different representations of three digit numbers. They can apply addition and subtraction facts up to 20. They identify equal groups of collections. Whereas our year fives who are at the minimum benchmark solve problems involving unit fractions, combination of addition and subtraction of two digit numbers and number facts to 10 by 10. They identify division as the inverse of multiplication. So these are the students who are at the minimum level. So uh, we, before we had minimum, national minimum standards, we had the national benchmarks. Some of you will still remember those being in our VELS document. Um, they were in the VELS document at level two. Um, so for at the end of grade two, the end of grade four, the end of grade six, because our testing was done early in the year. So these minimum standards have replaced those benchmarks and re you need to remember Remember, they are based on the results from the NAPLAN tests. So they will only give you the information that has been collected from the actual 
um, assessments. So uh, interestingly, on that site, it does say that students below the national minimum standard have not achieved the learning um, outcomes expected for their year level. They're at risk of being unable to progress satisfactorily. So I'm glad they've actually noted that. But I'm even happier that they've noted that students performed at the national minimum standard may also require additional assistance. So they're only including some of the skills. And I guess the more I work with students, the more I realise how much we really need to work very hard with our students who are not achieving. Jeff Masters um, has commented on many um, occasions that there is at least, he has evidence that there is at least a five year difference between the top 10% and bottom 10% in any classroom from year two onwards. Um, I think that difference grows. So if you're in grade five or six, I think you would probably agree with me. There's probably more than a five year difference. And of course, by the time the students get to year seven, they've almost given up. So we do need to make sure we um, address some of those concerns. So just if uh, I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to belabor this, but year three minimum standards talk about having typically developed computational fluency with addition and subtraction of small numbers, whereas in the year four, Tim's is saying they can actually add, subtract, multiply and divide. I think there's a lot of our students in year four who can't do those things. So this was just a comparison between the two. Again, some of you may have already seen um, this slide. I keep holding this one up because I keep thinking, how has Megan got to the end of her fourth year of school? This was the November of her year three, where we tested to, um, I, I guess, confirmed that our students who had received intervention at year one were succeeding. We certainly found that, but we also found other students like Megan who had slipped through the nets at year one. So again, I'll just give you a minute to have a look. Um, as I say, I know some of you have probably already seen this slide because I keep coming back to this slide thinking, what have we done? Why should, what could we have done? so that Megan didn't end up in this situation. So what can she do? And what is she struggling with? And do you have any idea about what she is actually trying to do? She does have strategies for every one of those tasks. It was an interview situation. She was given a card with those numbers, with each of those um, subtraction um, sentences on, and I actually read it out. So I would say to her, can you tell me what 20 take away 10 is? Okay, a little bit of time for people to look. Okay, so I've put together the slide. Um, again, I would, I would have taken responses from the floor. But uh, yes, Megan does have recall of fact families. She was able to tell me that she knew 20 take away 10 was 10 because she knew 10 and 10 were 20. She could do the same thing with the 10 take away five. So quite confident uh, with, it appears to be, she knows her doubles. For the 15 take away 13, she told me, she gave me an answer. She didn't write anything down but she tried to perform that rule in her head. So she obviously did it successfully. She could take the three from five and get two. She took one from one to get zero. So her answer was two. However, she was unsuccessful with those three that I've got there. And she had the same rule that she performed for each one. She had the same language. Six take away eight, you cannot do. Put down a zero, carry the one. I'm not sure where that magic one came from, but then she took one from one and ended up with zero. So same method she used. So she used a consistent method. She was able to articulate what she was doing. That's the benefit of doing it in an interview situation is you can actually ask them what they're doing. Uh, for the third one, nine takeaway eight, she put her fingers up one by one and got nine. I think you can see me and then did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, zero. And I said, oh, so nine take away eight is zero. Would you like to do that again? 
Now, to most kids, that means, uh-oh, I've got it wrong, but not to Megan. So she put up her nine. She had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Looked at her thumb for quite some time, then laid it down and said zero. There was no way known she was going to change her answer. For the 17 takeaway 16, I have worn out a videotape trying to work out what she try, was trying to do. Um, I know when I have PD, I, teachers make all sorts of lovely suggestions. I go back and look at the tape. She talks at one stage of dividing. I just don't think she, most of the kids just looked at me and thought, well, course 17 takeaway 16 is one, but not in Megan's world. It was, she was dividing, she was doing a whole lot. The language that she has used just doesn't make any sense. So then we look at her work for, um, these were worded problems. The one here, the 79 plus 50 is adding money. So she actually, I'm really impressed. She had to need, she needed the piece of paper. She wrote it out. So she wrote the 79, put down 50 underneath. Spoilt it all though when she read me the answer. She read the answer as $12.09 because you always have dollars and cents when you're using money. So I'm thinking 70 plus 50 does not add, she's not even hearing that 12 doesn't seem to be a sensible answer. With her subtraction one, she did exactly what she had done with those uh, two digit ones. So she said seven take, uh, one take away seven you can't do, put down the zero, carry the one. Three and one is four, take away one is three, one take away one is zero. You can see where she started to write the zero. This was to do with children's heights. So I said, oh, so Mary was 30 centimetres tall, was she? And she said, yes, I worked it out. And I said, is there anything on our table that would be 30 centimetres long? And she picked up the ruler. She was quite happy that this was not a sensible answer. She had worked it out. She'd used that one that she'd carried twice because it was there really um, quite distressing. As an interviewer, it's very hard not to comment. The one down the bottom here is division. So she set it up four into 32. However, she said, you can see the little line, four into two, you can't do. She's like, this can't do business is certainly very, very prevalent in her language. Four into two, you can't do. Put down a zero. This now becomes 32. Four into 32, she counted by fours and went four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, eight. And I said, so how many cars were needed? And she said, eight. And I said, but you've got, um, you've got zero there. And she said, but zero means nothing. And I'm thinking, if she does any sort of formal exam and she's written down 80, they're certainly not going to accept her answer as correct. The one at the top was supposed to be multiplication. It was nine lots of 12 eggs. Most year four students, year three students, uh, did nine lots of uh, 10 plus nine lots of two, or they doubled, they used lots of different strategies, but no, she went straight for the formal algorithm. She actually did the nine into two, I can't do, put down a zero, this now becomes 12. Despite the fact we started with 12, this is only a 12 if you've got a big one and a little two. 9 into 12 is 1 and 1 over, 1 and 1 over is 10. And so her language, is she has absolutely no idea. Can I say the scariest part was the fact she entered the interview saying, I'm really good at maths and spelling now um, because she had a tutor. So I worked out very quickly she wasn't very good at maths and I suspect the um, teacher worked out she wasn't very good at spelling. But you have to wonder. What was the tutor? What strategies was the teacher using with this particular student? Trying to teach her rules and procedures, which of course she has used and mis mis misused because this is she's trying to le learn rules and procedures which make no sense. So I've also done work in um, year four classrooms where we had um, students um, do a paper and pencil test. So on the left-hand side is one student's work. I've just picked out a few examples. On the right-hand side is another. So the student on the left is able to add um, the two, she's interpreted the word problems, able to use a calculation successfully. 
The second one has been able to do the subtraction, so she certainly would be at the minimum standard. The surprise is that when she was working out how many chocolates there were in seven bags, she resorted back to um, repeated addition. The student on the right, in many cases, got only got two of the uh, subtraction ones correct. And with uh, this one, this one, and this one was one out. So my suspicion is, and certainly if I'm doing a paper and pencil test, if I'm getting results I don't expect, I would tend to go back and ask the student, can you tell me what you were thinking? Can you show me what you did? My suspicion is she went 14, 13, 12, 11. The answer is four. Not sure what she did with the 15, um, 16 take away eight, why she's got that answer. But the others are all the one out. So she's obviously started subtracting from the wrong number. She managed to get the right answer for uh, the first worded problem, the addition one. Her calculation doesn't seem to match. Uh, and for the subtraction one, she um, has suggested, um, she has picked up the fact that Mary's kitten is 17 centimetres shorter than Tom's cat. She has just read Mary's kitten is 17 centimetres. So pick that answer. And that's quite a, a, a not a, an unusual answer when students are struggling with maths. Uh, the chocolates one, she has resorted to using tally marks. I'm actually quite impressed the fact that her tally marks are quite structured. Uh, a lot of children using tally marks have random ones. The problem with this particular student is she couldn't count the 42. She's, she's drawn 42, but um, counted 43. So counting is for her an issue. So um, with that particular uh, grade four group, I did use Peter Westwood's test. I like Peter Westwood's um, one minute tests because they each one just takes one minute. It, you can gain a lot of information about your students. Uh, you don't need to present them in that way. You may want to allow the students more time to see which ones they can accurately do. If you are using the Peter Westwood test, he does say give them on different uh, occasions so that the students aren't being confused as to which process they're using. But I guess what I want to highlight were the results. And I'm hoping you can't actually see on screen what they re refer to, uh, but you certainly will if you highlight it later. So the one on the left top uh, left hand corner is addition. So you'll see for 122 students from one cohort at one school, there are five different classes. There are students who can get um, the high marks. There are also lots of students who aren't doing so well on that automatic response, because that's what we're testing. Do they have automatic response? Do they know those skills off by heart pretty quickly? Uh, when we look to the right, this one is the results for multiplication. And you can see the graph, there's fewer students here who are getting those higher ones. It could be about the fact they don't have speed. But when you consider how much time prior to year four we spend getting kids to learn their tables, I was sort of a bit blown away by this result. Oh, sorry, this is um, subtraction. I've got that wrong. Uh, subtraction is what we'd expect. There are lots of students who only get a few right. The one down on the bottom left-hand corner here, um, that's multiplication. And the results actually are worse than subtraction, despite the fact we do spend lots of time um, focusing on learning our tables. And the Peter Westwood ones are done in the sorts of ways that the kids would do, although I think they, they learn to recite them off. It's a bit like one of my grandsons always learned how to do the blue words by remembering which order they are in. If you just picked on a random one, he struggled. So maybe students are doing much the same thing. The one on the right hand side on the bottom corner is division. And every class I went into, there were students who said, oh, but I can't do division. Well, they proved themselves right. They were really struggling with that automatic response for division. So again, a nice, quick, easy test, um, but you may want to consider, give them extra time. Is it that they don't know it? When I look at these things, I look to see how many do they attempt? How many do they get correct? Um, do they actually choose which ones they know? We need to get them in the habit of being able to respond to ones they know rather than try and do it in a systematic order. 
So another one, uh, uh, one of my um, things that, that I like to is to think about, and it is something to think about. If I ask you to put those red, um, the addition um, tasks in order, can you decide which is easiest? Can you decide which is harder? If I ask you to do the same thing with the subtraction, can you choose which one is easier, which one is harder? So think about the order that you would find easiest and then contemplate what order do you think that your students would find. Now, those of you in early childhood, just think about your response. And those of you in perhaps the earlier grades of school, you might want to think, okay, well, what, what are the implications for me? But think about what are you considering? What is it that you need to think about to decide which one's easiest and which one's hardest? Okay, I'll give you a minute or two to have a look at those. I've put down the content descriptors on the right hand side. Someone might like to share, people might like to share in the chat what they think, what their order is. You'll notice I've given them a, a, an alphabetic code so that you can just do the ABC or whatever it is you want to do. Okay, so hopefully you've had enough time to think about what order would I find easiest? What order would I find hardest? Now, if we go to the next slide, think about these and think about, well, again, I've now I've mixed up addition, subtraction, I've mixed up um, other criteria. So have a look at these and think about, well, what do you need to do? Which ones do you think are the easiest? And which ones do you think are the hardest before thinking about what your students might think? So maybe in the chat, you could uh, include the sorts of things you are considering as you are trying to put these um, in order. So what is important? What, what is important about the choice of the tasks? What do you need to consider? I notice people are adding to the chat, that's great. Um, I can't actually see it at the moment, but I will come to that in a minute. Okay, so <coughs> when we're providing tasks for students, and I go back to, I think I <clears throat> this is where I, I really connect with what Alan was talking about um, yesterday, is how do you decide on the order easiest to hardest? If we were in the lecture theatre and I asked you to talk to the person beside you, would their order be exactly the same as your order? If I asked you to consider the students in your class um, or in the early childhood setting, if I asked you to consider the, your colleagues um, that you work with, would their order be the same or would it be different? Is there something common? Would, is the easiest one the same for everybody and the hardest one the same for everybody? Or what is it that it thinks? Thinking about, okay, so if we're thinking about the order and um, Scott, could I ask you just to read out a couple of the comments in the chat? Did people um, write comments about what they needed to consider? Certainly, there's a few that have come through. So um, things about students struggling with number sentences when they need to find the missing number and also when the numbers yep. are apparent. Uh, not knowing where to start when the first number is missing yep. is something that will be a bit yep. difficult. Um, of course, thinking about, uh, someone gave a couple of orders, thinking about the straight 
uh, forward ones first and then the missing add-ins being more difficult. Uh, students need, needing to have a flexible understanding of what the equal sign means, seeing as, it, as equivalence, not the answer. Yep. Um, yeah, lots of really good ideas. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Scott. No worries. Okay. <laughs> so um, happy for people to keep thinking about that. But again, what strategy are you expecting? Would you expect the same strategies at year two, year three, year four? And if we go back to Jeff talking about a five year difference, yes, you will have students in year two who it won't matter in which order you, uh, you um, expect them to do things. For some of our year fours, they're struggling um, even to think about a missing ad end or even just to successfully solve one where we're asking for the response at the, in, at the end after the equal sign. So we do need to know about the types of strategies students are using and thinking about what about those students who are using tally marks, many of those um, tasks that were on those um, slides certainly involve very large numbers and uh, don't be surprised if you see some students and I've used the, these sorts of tasks from grade two even up to year nine and I still see evidence of students trying to use more, um, very um, tally marks for very large numbers and they just don't, and they, there's certainly no way of setting them out neatly. Okay so um, uh, Ali talked about this morning about different resources so um, I um, we spent time developing the Math Developmental Continuum, although that's disappeared off the um, department website. I don't think there's a link to it. We haven't been able to find it. Um, here's one of the tasks that was used um, to or, or given as a demonstration. So if you can access uh, tasks like this, you could go back to the Smart Big website. And um, I'm not sure how long they will stay there. We're very lucky that it's currently on that um, server that it means teacher asking what to put in the box and of course then uh, we have students like Luke and Cameron. <coughs> Luke of course um, ignores the five but adds the seven and six and this relates to what Scott said this notion of equality. We do need to do lots more work on equality. Do the students know that seven and six is the same as um, eight plus five, or do they just think equals means give me an answer? And back in the dark ages when I was teaching where quiz and air was used, year two students were very good at equality because they could match up the uh, coloured rods, they could actually write down lots of number sentences, lots of equality. They knew that seven and six was eight plus five, they also knew it was nine plus four. So they would have lots of different ways of writing that. They could transpose, they could substitute. The current equivalent, I guess, is the Numicon material. If people haven't seen Numicon, have a look at that because it certainly is useful. But yes, so there's lots of kids who are Luke's or Cameron's where they either just add the numbers on the left-hand side or they add all the possible numbers. So I do have to put in some fraction tasks. Max, I know you're watching. So um, thinking about our students in the upper grades, um, certainly thinking about um, in TIMS, they said our students needed to look at number and fractions. So okay, here's some fraction tasks. Uh, for those of you coming this afternoon to the fraction um, workshop, we'll talk more about this. But thinking of tasks where um, we've marked the number line zero to three quarters, Think about why would we have included A, B and C? Well, as my talk this afternoon says, three quarters is nearly one. So yes, there are students who would pick A. Uh, lots of different strategies for choosing the correct answer. Uh, some, although, will choose C because it's near the end of the line and they think all number lines finish in one. The, um, the other one is matching, and I think this also goes back to, relates to what Alan, I put this one in because of Alan's talk yesterday, talking about the links between uh, fractions and decimals. I think he went a bit further. But being, um, so looking at these sorts of tasks at the upper primary to determine what students know about fractions. So thanks to Max and to my um, other supervisor, Robin, for some of that help. So I've just put in a couple of examples. We found that at year five and six, five, there were about 70% of students would choose the, chose the correct answer, C. 
75% at grade six. So there's still a lot of kids at that upper primary level who don't actually recognise that this is where the number three quarters sits. Uh, if that's the case, then C is at one. Uh, this particular, they were also asked why, and this particular student said uh, that A and B were too close, whereas other students were able to divide the line up and talk in much more um, sophisticated ways. Uh, and here's evidence that, yes, there was a, a student who said because they were too far to be one, so they, their assumption is three quarters has to be nearly, nearly one. So they've chosen A because the others were too far away. When we um, look at this task, this is a task I have used for a very long time um, in my work with uh, Robert Hunting um, in the early fraction research, also with um, working with Catholic teachers when I was at CEO and now with the fraction research, 65% of year fives and 74% of year sixes were able to mark all of them. Far too many of them thought that one quarter and 0.4 matched uh, and were quite happy then to match two fifths with 0.25. So they actually don't understand fractions. So these are misconceptions we know that are prevalent. So as teachers, we need to think about, well, how are we going to ensure that doesn't happen? One of my concerns is that two, most of them could tell me that 0.5 was equal to a half, but couldn't actually explain why. So yes, they've learnt it, they know what it is, but they're not able to explain. So as I said, the TIMS, uh, the results said that schools should focus on improving primary school knowledge of number, including simple equations, fractions and decimals, as well as measurement and geometry. So this is just highlighting, with, this is uh, reinforcing, we've already found this, this is uh, part of it. Um, <coughs> I am going to run out of time, as I knew I would, but I wanted to sort of put a heads up to maths recovery. So Bob Wright, um, back in the early 90s, set up maths recovery. If you want to know more about it, maths recovery um, at, uh, for year one students is offered in um, places like the UK and the States. Uh, he did do some work with the Catholic Education Office with year three students. Um, so maths recovery has not been um, offered systematically around Australia because it was pro it, they felt the systems people felt it was too expensive. So uh, you can read that. But when I first heard Bob present his work, which is, as I said, in the early, um, early 90s, I came away from his presentation thinking, as a primary teacher, I'd only just gone into research, I realised that there were things as a primary teacher I didn't know. I didn't realise that the students had quite, uh, a lot of students were using the count all strategy, that in order to solve six plus three, some of them were counting six, one, two, three, four, five, six, then counting three, one, two, three, and then trying to count the six and the three. And most of them were unsuccessful. They became much more successful when they started with one, counted the six, but kept going. So they would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It wasn't until they were successful with their counting by one strategy that they developed a strategy for counting to count on and could count on from six to get to nine. Now, initially they start six, seven, eight. So a bit like that student who was doing subtraction starting from the wrong number. So that seems to be fleeting. They do then go six, seven, eight, nine. But initially, they will start from whichever number comes first. So if I had 2 plus 17, they may well start count, counting on from 2 rather than choosing 17. And as people said, where do I start? I, uh, I need to have a strategy for subtraction in order to solve the last one because the starting number is not obvious. So this impacted, we set up our maths um, intervention program which will aim to identify and then assist year children in year one. So this did build on Bob Wright's work. Uh, we did um, have a withdrawal program and my suggestion, I, I strongly believe that for some of our students who are at risk, they do need to be removed from the classroom because they need 95% of your time. Like Alan said, they the tasks need to be at their level. They um, we did, it with maths intervention, focus on number. Uh, and what, what we found was it 
very dependent on the ability what they don't know. Um, the child who is needing additional assistance is the one who's always sharpening a pencil or going to the toilet or having a drink. So avoidance. They're very good at avoidance, not quite so good at starting the task. Uh, identifying the extent of the problem. So part of the issue is how far back, if I'm looking at initially we thought mass intervention should only be offered at year one, just like reading recovery, let's catch them up and they'll be fine. But the more work I do, the more I realise we actually need intervention at every year level. Otherwise, those bottom 25% in your classroom are going to remain the bottom 25%. Um, and then have the expertise. How do I actually cater for this? And, and as Alan said, finding that zone of proximal development, which how can I create tasks where they are happy to engage, that they um, want to, that is, they will experience success. So we had an interview, and if you look at that later, you'll see very similar. This was a pre this preceded the maths online interview. So, and it certainly when we matched up with Bob Wright's interview, which we weren't didn't have, uh, we only knew about the sorts of things Bob did. When we both compared our interviews, we found, of course, we were asking the same thing because it was based on the same research. But it was quite. Um, I suppose, confirming, knowing that we independently created an interview which was very similar to Bob's. So yeah, these are the results. We, they're quite scary that uh, we had 40% uh, of year one students who couldn't count backwards from 20. We had, um, and, and you can see the other results there, uh, there were 60% who could not create correctly name. We know there's difficulties with the teen numbers. Um, and matching up those, those numerals. Uh, and then we found that there were 24% at the lowest counting stage of the Les, Les Steffi's counting stage. That means they could only count things they could see, hear or feel, while 40% were, did, uh, certainly could not, um, did not have a strategy for subtraction. So they're the common difficulties. Uh, scary part was that when I presented these, and they, these won't be um, unusual, won't be unexpected, uh, when I presented these and was followed by someone doing intervention at year seven, her comment was, Kath, these are exactly the same as my year sevens. And that's pretty sad that we are, actually have students at that particular level. <coughs> so um, I, I guess, this slide, I think, matches very nicely with what Alan said. We need to, so with any intervention program, you do need to start from what the student knows. You need to provide a range of appropriate materials. Uh, can they draw or represent their materials? Asking lots of questions and, and certainly in that video of the children, I'm not sure our intervention children would get to the point of being able to challenge someone else, but we, cer we certainly ask them to explain what they were doing. And, um, while you don't have access to our intervention um, interview, you certainly have access to the online interview. So you will see those questions have been designed to give you lots of information, not just about whether or not the students can get it correct, but whether or not they, uh, the types of strategies they are using. So also linked to the growth points. Now I know um, there have been some changes um, although these are the current ones at the moment, but these are the ones that relate to that original Steffi research. So being able to think about, do the, are the students still using the count all strategy? Well, yes, there's a lot of year nine students who are still using the count all, and some of them are still using their fingers. Please don't tell them to put away their fingers. They'll have nothing left, they'll have to guess. There are students who um, at that higher level can count on, but don't have a strategy for subtraction. So yes, they might be successful with addition, but are they successful for subtraction? So if you want some help, um, I would encourage the early childhood people to go and have a look at that interview as well and look at the growth points and see how, what your, how your students uh, match up. Um, as part of some work at ACR, one of the things I did, there's a, a um, easily accessible document called Working Out What Works that does include things for literacy and numeracy. You just, um, one of the things I did was look at the growth points, look at the incremental steps, and then think about some suggested activities. 
this is getting a little bit old and I'm sure there's other things around about uh, as well, but if you're interested, that's there for your um, app to be able to access. For our early childhood um, people, think about, um, have, a, have a look at the Let's Count program. It's a, an early maths program for children aged three to five, developed in conjunction with the Smith family by Bob Perry and Anne Gervasoni. So um, there are videos on that website. So have a look. Um, you may find that um, you can get some support from that Let's Count program. And I know I'm nearly finished, Peter. <laughs> uh, many students are mathematically at risk and struggling to solve a range of mathematical tasks because they don't have the foundational skills. Do they have the counting? Do they have place value? Can they add? Can they subtract? Can they multiply? Can they divide? Uh, they need a whole range of experiences. One of the things we found with intervention, you need to do the same thing over and over again. But by changing a colour or a type or a shape, that's enough for the kids to take on board. Too many primary, and I'll add in there too, secondary uh, students rely on inefficient methods such as guessing, trying to remember a rule like Megan, using tally marks like the year four student I showed you, or use that inefficient method as a count all, which Di talks about as well. So you do need to encourage students to use concrete materials, the appropriate ones. Draw, do the 2D representations. It could be drawings, diagrams, use on our, on our um, computers um, and iPads. Encourage them to use words and symbols. As I keep saying to people, I would be sabotaging the literacy block and making sure that they're using those words and symbols in literacy, because mathematical literacy is really a form. Focus should be on developing and demonstrating the four proficiencies not just on rote learning. So are they fluent? Can they choose the right process? Can they problem solve? Do they use reasoning? Do they demonstrate their understanding? And last one, uh, teachers and, and educators need good conceptual understanding about maths and the possible and common misconceptions. I know it's hard. There's a lot of research, certainly in my area of fractions and in intervention. We know the difficulties, so we need access to that. Uh, we need appropriate assessment instruments. The online interview is fantastic, but do you know how to use it? Do you know what you're looking for? Uh, certainly when it was first introduced, teachers undertook training. Uh, at La Trobe, we ran a six day program on how to become good interviewers. So, and monitoring, like Alan said, you need to monitor those students' responses. So we need tasks that start with what the student knows. So engage them. They need to be scaffolded. So what's the next little step? What's the next little step? What's the next little step for our kids who need that additional assistance? We need to emphasise the language of maths and build up vocabulary. So in our early childhood centres, please make sure that the children start to understand what more than, less than, larger than, smaller than, taller than. Those sorts of things occur in, that every, in your early childhood settings all the time. Relate to their everyday experiences, so where we can make connections and then allow our expect students to explain how they solve the tasks. And on that point, Peter, I will stop and I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Kath. We'll see if any people would like to pop some questions into the chat, but you, you know, there's a lot there obviously and a lot of work we need to do. A couple of things that come to mind for me are, you know, Di Siemens' big ideas and yep. the way they're you know, now also embedding those more explicitly in the new draft of the Australian curriculum. Yep. And, you know, I know the work we're doing with year 10 students um, with the Department of Ed in the middle years literacy numeracy strategy to help those year 10 students that oh. are behind. Um, we're using those big ideas and we're teaching year 10 teachers how to teach the basics again oh. to students who've missed it. And the secondary teachers don't know how to do that. They don't necessarily know how to fill in the gaps and, and the, the and what those foundational mathematics concepts related to the big ideas actually are that the students are missing and then how to rectify it. So, you know, I like that the Australian curriculum was being more explicit about those big ideas. We now need to make sure all primary teachers know how to make sure we don't create the gaps in the first place, which is a challenge in itself and, and really build the foundations for future learning. So those, you know, the kids at year seven that you identify have the same issues at year one is a, Real disappointment, so scary. But a real challenge. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was even scarier watching the year 11 when he was trying to factorise a just a quadratic 
thinking he could do all this as a primary student and now he's not recognising that there's a common factor across those three terms. Mm. Um, he, he got frustrated because I could actually factorise something. Now, I haven't done that level of maths for a very long time, but I could look at the numbers and say, okay, well, those two numbers are multiplied together and those two, are, and the same two are added together. It has to be either this or this and have a, having a bit of a go. He just didn't even know where to start and, and yeah. yet he's not incapable. And, and he was saying a lot of his friends are going to drop out of methods because it's all too hard. It's not too hard. It's the arithmetic that's letting them down. It's not the higher level maths. Mm. And that's scary. So here's a question for you. If we identify students who are performing well below the national average at the end of the year, despite intervention, what approach should teachers schools then take? Should this student repeat the year level? Uh, my suggestion, I don't like repeating students repeating the year level. My suggestion is as soon as you identify there's a problem, especially for those students who are a long way below, providing additional assistance. That's going to involve um, funding something. Uh, certainly, I did some work out at, in the, some of the Eltham schools where they set up an intervention program at year three um, to catch those children up. Uh, we had Even Start, uh, which was a one-year tutoring program put on by the federal government where um, ACR staff created uh, the tests. They came up with solutions for what to do, so tutors were chosen. Some of those materials are still in schools, but I think you'll find those students who are way below are the ones who have to be removed from the classroom. I know that goes flies against what a lot of other maths educators say, but with my experience dealing with students who are at risk, you actually do need to allow them to thrive in a, in a, in a little small setting where they can make mistakes. They can actually say things that don't make sense. They're not embarrassed to use concrete materials, whereas the rest of my class aren't using concrete materials, so I won't want to do so. Yeah. We ran maths intervention um, with year one and year two, uh, and often the students who weren't part of the maths withdrawal program would say, when's it our turn to have fun? Because And the students came out much more confident. Um, we didn't give them as much time as we would have liked. And even at year three, we found even if you can only do one extra lesson a week, a half hour session, please don't make the sessions too long for kids who are struggling. Half hour sessions, uh, you know, even half an hour a week would be better than nothing at all. The more you can give them, the better they'll be. Um, but you need to be very, very patient because you, what you teach them today may need revising 23 times before they get it. But once they've got those building blocks, they don't look back. There's a comment here from Sarah, which, which makes me think a lot about what you're saying. It says, we, I think we sometimes rush students through when we think they can count to 20 or 100 and have number sense and they actually don't. And, you know, as you were indicating there, you need to have enough time to make sure that those skills are reinforced uh, and not just, you know, that's that thing if we need to cover the curriculum so we keep moving, but we're leaving yeah. some of these kids behind without those fundamental skills. Yeah. I think we've got to stop. I think we've got to stop and breathe and say, okay, this is my little group here who appear to count to 20, but um, if I start them at a different number, can they still do it? So um, going back to in our early years, our early childhood, thinking about those five counting principles and making sure they're in place. Then think about place value. Is that in place? Do they actually understand? Can they create 37? Do they know 37 is 37 ones as well as three tens and seven ones? If you can't do that, you're not going to be able to cope with decimals. So we do, as you say, and even when I looked at some of the content descriptors, thinking about addition and subtraction, there's content descriptors at year two, year three. It's in uh, pattern and algebra in year four. Addition and subtraction disappear from our curriculum after that. We take up uh, multiplication and division. But, you know, so for some kids, they're still way back and we need to think about what is the absolute minimum we need to do with these kids. And once you catch them up, um, a little anecdote, um, when we did have the year two intervention, the children in intervention, were, we were very focused on the building blocks. We were very focused on developing their counting and their place value skills and their addition and subtraction. They did the same classroom test as everybody else and they had been focusing on something different. The um, year two teacher was mortified that the children who had been doing part of the year two um, intervention actually performed better than most of the other children. So she was just horrified that her classroom teaching obviously 
you know, they, that, that the kids who'd had intervention were actually doing better. Mm. So... Kath, one, one last question, <laughs> short one, hopefully, so that we can make sure people get a break is from your presentation, there's a lot of things that we need to tackle in maths education. If there's one place that you would suggest we start as a priority, I guess that's like where should people go first to take that first next step to maybe change what they're doing? Uh, I guess I would go back to, um, and I would go back, certainly think about very seriously using interview to um, ascertain where children are at. Uh, I wouldn't perform the whole interview. It might be in um, prep. We do the prep detour in grade one. We might look at the counting parts. Uh, if they do well, you can move on. But we need to go beyond paper and pencil tests. We actually need to start listening very, very carefully to what students are saying. Don't assume they can count from one to 20 because you might find when you actually stand and listen to them, they're saying 30, 40, 50. So... Uh, if I had a magic wand, I would make sure there was enough funding in every school to provide intervention programs for those students who need it. But I don't have a magic wand. I've been trying for 20 years and it still hasn't happened. <laughs> Thanks, Kath. It's fantastic. And look, if people would like have further questions or want to get in touch with Kath, her PowerPoint will be available on, in the event yep. portal. And I think, Kath, does that have your details in it? It does. And I'm does. more than happy to talk to people. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So you can follow up with Kath there if you want some further questions or support. Thanks so much, everybody. We're, we're back at 10.30 in the event portal. Go to the next session at 10.30 and make your choice and we will see you online. Have a great day and enjoy the sessions coming up. Cheers for now. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.